Hi, I'm Justin Peel, and I'm in Palm Harbor, Florida, interviewing Dr. Lawrence Litz for a school biography project. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Litz. I'm glad to be able to discuss some of the work that I did many, many years ago on the Atomic Energy Program. And I think Justin has some questions he was interested in getting answers to. Mm -hmm. So, what is your full name? Lawrence M. Litz. Middle initial M for Marvel. When were you born? October 22nd, 1921. What was your childhood like? Very good. I grew up with a younger brother and younger sister in Chicago. And we always were happy with what we were doing, even though we were living in the middle of the Depression. Hmm. So, what was it like working in the war? Exciting in a sense that the work itself was very interesting. The fact that the war was going on and what we were doing was supposed to help end it uh, was not as critical in our everyday thinking. But the programs that I had to work on were very exciting. So what led you to become a scientist? I guess that was just how I like to think. Uh, I took chemistry in eighth grade uh, elementary school and was involved with chemistry and physics ever since. Stop. Ask him about when he blew up the attic. <laughs> when did you blow up the attic? <laughs> well, it happened that uh, I, we had a very nice attic with lots of room in our house in Chicago. and. I had my chemistry set there, and one day what I was doing happened to be a little explosive and splattered uh, liquid all over the ceiling of the attic. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so what did you still study when you were in college? Well, I went to the University of Chicago. Actually, I went to a uh, secondary uh, element, uh, junior college, Wright Junior College in Chicago, uh, studying chemistry and just general topics. And then when I went to the University of Chicago, I majored in chemistry with a minor in uh, mathematics. And then uh, <clears throat> and this was in, uh, I graduated from Chicago in June of 1942. On June 12th, uh, I left school got married on June 13th, and on June 14th I went down to Florence, Alabama and started working at an ammonia plant in Florence, Alabama for the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, as part of uh, my scientific experience for industrial activities. Uh, and then, then, of course, while I was there, we had a laboratory with starting with 12 men in, in the control laboratory for the ammonia plant. Uh, and by a year later, well, that is in June of 43, we were 11 women, one man, myself, and a group leader. And I decided that I ought to get involved in something that was uh, more uh, attractive to a man than being in a lab with 11 other women. <laughs> So I left and I went back to Chicago to wait out my time while I was looking for a job. Went to one day somebody said that there was uh, work going at uh, the University of Chicago. And I went there and they said, well, you know, you've been working at the la uh, industrial laboratory. Uh, we would love to have you, but they wouldn't tell me what we were what I was going to work on, but that it was going to be very interesting. So I took the job there in uh, November 1943, uh, spent some interesting time studying the effect of radiation on materials having to do with the nuclear reactor that was being built in uh, <coughs> uh, I forget what state, but up north somewhere. 
<clears throat> and then uh, when that work, uh, the, the actual construction started, uh, they uh, shut down my job because they were satisfied that they could live with what they knew about the effect of radiation, and they transferred me to Los Alamos. And mm -hmm. Los Alamos, I got involved with some chemistry work at the beginning, but then they needed somebody who had experience in high vacuum metal, uh, high vacuum technology, and uh, <coughs> I joined a, a group that uh, was going to work on plutonium which was a newly uh, uh, conceived element. <coughs> the uh, plutonium was just then being produced in uh, the Hanford Washington nuclear reactor. And uh, at the beginning, we would get very tiny quantities of it. About, uh, oh, it must have been, I started there in March of 1944, and uh, <clears throat> within about, oh, I would say a month, I had built a high vacuum system that could purify metallic plutonium, <clears throat> and uh, then there was this one particular day of interest when I had the first small amount of plutonium as a salt put into the high vacuum system reacted it with magnesium metal to form plutonium metal and magnesium chloride, which was boiled off in the high vacuum system. And we had a little tiny button about an eighth of an inch diameter of metallic plutonium. So I was the first person ever to see metallic plutonium. And it turns out that my wife Evelyn was working in health physics at that time, and she was responsible for checking the laboratories for stray radioactivity. She happened to walk in my laboratory just at the right time, and I told her to look into this little telescope to look down on the crucible containing the plutonium. And uh, so she was then the second person on Earth to see a piece of uh, metallic plutonium. And this is... Uh, I had also developed this material, which is cerebata sulfide. It's golden color and is very resistant to reaction with uh, the chemical that are involved in the plutonium metal chemistry. And it's the kind of thing in which uh, the early pieces of plutonium were uh, melted. And later on, the uh, quantities got bigger and bigger, and I had developed the procedures to stabilize plutonium because plutonium was uh, a metal that had six different crystal phases between, well, as it was heated between room temperature and its melting point, which is about 800 degrees centigrade, or about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And <coughs> the the problem was that we couldn't make a bomb with a material that would change shape due to its changing crystal form as it got hot. And it finally turned out that when I could mix it with small amounts of gadolinium, and all this information is now uh, in the open literature, but of course in those days it was absolutely secret, uh, about 3% gadolinium. That stabled one of the phases so that we could make the spheres that were going to go into the atomic bomb uh, and they wouldn't change shape uh, as the bomb warmed up from uh, room temperature to the point where it exploded, but would stay as a sphere configuration. The bomb itself was designed as a a piece of plutonium, and it's actually two half spheres, hemispheres, that were put together to make a full sphere. And in the middle were some uh, elements that would produce neutrons as the uh, reaction procedure proceeded. And these neutrons caused the uh, plutonium to undergo fission and release very large amounts of energy. <coughs> so. Uh, the, 
and th this sphere, which might have been, oh, perhaps eight inches in diameter, uh, was put inside of a casing of high explosives that was about, I guess, maybe four feet in diameter. And uh, when... Uh, the picture. Yeah. Oh, yes. And here are pictures of a uh, what the bomb looked like that uh, were these uh, uh, units were built m many years later uh, to show in a uh, program that was held at Los Alamos to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And uh, I'm standing beside one and my wife Evelyn is standing beside the bomb in, in another picture. <coughs> the Newspaper is the first publication that released to the public the, the fact that we had an atomic bomb and it, that it was dropped on Japan. Now, actually, this particular bomb that was first dropped was dropped on uh, Hiroshima and it was made of uranium. But we had made a plutonium bomb earlier and tested it in the uh, at Albuquerque near Albuquerque New Mexico to find out whether the whole concept of having this high explosive mass going off and actually compressing the plutonium sphere and causing it to become explosive where it was not explosive in its form as we built it and of course this was a, a, a completely new concept in uh, causing a bomb to explode. But uh, they tested it in, in the desert there uh, in southern New Mexico and found out that it had the explosive force of about 20,000 tons of TNT from this little tiny sphere of plutonium metal when, that, when it had been, uh, went fishing. So, <clears throat> The first bomb that was dropped was the one that was dropped on uh, Hiroshima and that bomb was made from pieces of uh, uranium-235 that were shot uh, slug into a, a solid uh, unit of uranium-235 such that when the, this piece entered the, the whole thing became critical or explosive. Uh, the second, the war, of course, was going on. Plans were underfoot to invade Japan. As a matter of fact, when the war ended, as a consequence of our dropping the, these two bombs on Japan, my brother, who was in the army in uh, Alaska, was getting ready to board ship for the invasion of Japan. Mm. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, who was head of our Los Alamos project, had talked to us for about two hours the day before the bomb was actually dropped. We had shipped it to uh, the Tinian Islands to be carried on to Japan. And he pointed out the fact that our military had estimated that had we gone through with, or would we go through with the invasion, which was uh, fully under uh, schedule then, to happen a week later, that we probably would have lost about a million men. Mm. And after the war ended, the Japanese told us that they too had estimated that had there been a normal invasion of Japan, that probably a million Japanese would have been killed. Mm. Now, <clears throat> in the two cities that were bombed, say the second city was bombed was Nagasaki. Uh, it was bombed a few days after the first bomb was dropped and it was the bomb that caused the war to, uh, or let's say, have, have the Japanese make the decision to give up to the Allies in, in, the, in World War II. And they too had estimated that had we gone through the invasion that probably a million Japanese would have been killed in, in the course of the invasion and the war that would be going on during the period of the fighting. So the, we, 
the two bombs, the two cities that were destroyed by the two atomic bombs, uh, lost about a hundred thousand people as a consequence. But <clears throat> one of the things that's pointed out in this article, and this, this article is the, as I said, the first public announcement that there was such a thing as a atomic bomb and that it was dest destroyed. But also a little, right in the middle of the thing, <clears throat> is an ar article which says that more uh, uh, Nippon or Japanese cities are being uh, put into smoldering ruins by our conventional bombing because at that point in time every day there were a thousand plane raids on different Japanese cities which were completely destroying the cities. So with our bomb we didn't do anything more than was being done every single day before and would have been ongoing afterward where we were essentially wiping out Japan. Hmm. And of course, the war ended, and everybody was very happy, <laughs> including me. <laughs> and I stayed with the uh, Manhattan Project at Los Alamos for, oh, let's see, about another month and a half or so. I left in September of 1945 and went back to graduate school at Ohio State and got my Ph.D. in physical chemistry, so I became a doctor of physical chemistry. Cool. All right. So to be selected into the war, you like volunteered or? Yes. I, well, I, I was looking for a job. <laughs> I mean, everything, almost everything that, uh, let's say, a scientist would do during that period uh, uh, was likely to be involved with the war effort. The ammonia plant that, uh, in uh, Muscle Shoals, uh, Tennessee uh, made uh, ammonia, but a larger part of that ammonia was converted into nitrates, which were used in making bomb materials. So uh, the fact that we were working on something that hopefully would help to end the war uh, wasn't a great concern, and they say uh, when Robert when Robert Oppenheimer talked to us about that, he was made that point very strongly that hopefully uh, the thing we would do could bring the war to an end, and it did. How did you react? How did you first react to when you were told that you had the job to be in the war? Well, I was just happy to have a job. Uh, as a scientist, uh, I was ready to do almost any type of science that I was knowledgeable in. And of course, the interesting, uh, an interesting aspect of this is that uh, most of my science had to do with uh, uh, chemistry in, in water and in different types of uh, solutions, different type of materials. I really had very little training in metallurgy, uh, but the fact that I knew how to build and run high vacuum systems was a critical fact that in my case, I was the, the right guy to take on the job of doing the research involved in uh, determining how to uh, purify the plutonium metal how to alloy it, and uh, I worked, of course, with many other scientists, for example, who would do the research on what the crystal structures were and so on, tell me what was going on, and see what I could do to fix things. <laughs> so, how did you get to New Mexico if you lived <laughs> in uh, Chicago? Yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's a slightly interesting story. Uh, the train, uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico is about 35 miles north-northwest of Santa Fe. And uh, when I was transferred to, to Los Alamos, I didn't know what things were being done there because, again, the secrecy was such that the people in Chicago 
did not know that we were truly working on an atomic bomb. We knew that we were working with radioactive materials, but the fact that the goal was to produce an atomic bomb was not known to this large laboratory of scientists at Chicago. And, and, uh, and we didn't even know where Los Alamos was. The, the group that I worked for in Chicago bought a trade ticket for myself and my wife and our little puppy uh, to go on the Santa Fe Chief from uh, Chicago to Los Alamos. Well, I'm sorry, from Chicago to Santa Fe. Well, the train doesn't actually, the passenger train doesn't actually go to Santa Fe. The passenger train goes to a little town called Lamy, New Mexico, which is about 18 miles south of Santa Fe. And we got off the train at Lamy and we sat down at the bench of the railroad station and everybody else that was on the... Hold on. Everybody else who was on the train uh, got on the bus that took them from Lamy to Santa Fe. But I wasn't told that I was supposed to get on the bus. So my wife and I and our baggage and our little puppy were sitting there on the train of, in Lamy, which is just a very tiny town built around the railroad station. And uh, everybody had gone and we were sitting there and then about half a block away in the parking lot, there were a couple of military cars. <coughs> and after we were sitting there for almost a half hour, uh, a man from got up from one of the cars and came over and talked to me and so, said, weren't you at the Met Lab? Oh, we got birds now. We got birds. So the man asked me whether I had been at the Met Lab, which is what the laboratory at the university for the Manhattan Project was called. And I said, yes, it turned out that he recognized me because he had worked there and, and seen me there. And he says, are you going to the hill? Well, I didn't know what the hill, what the hill was, <laughs> but I said, I guess so, since I assumed that he was going to Los Alamos too. And so we, my wife and I and our stuff got in the car and they took us to Santa Fe where there was the entering office for Los Alamos and the lady there checked out my uh, uh, my uh, identification and said yes you're due up there and so we got in another car and they took us to Los Alamos which is up in the mountains about 35 miles as I said north northwest of Santa Fe when we got to Los Alamos, they said, you weren't supposed to bring your wife with you. Well, they knew, I, I mean, in Chicago, they knew I was bringing my wife, so they bought the ticket for the two of us. But uh, they said, well, they had assigned a small apartment uh, uh, to us, but hadn't anticipated her being there for another week or two. So we, they managed to get a couple of beds and a couple of lamps put in so that we could sleep there that night and they could furnish it the next day. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, when I first uh, got there, I was working with uh, some other scientists uh, making what, was called, what they called a water boiler, which would be a nuclear reactor with a uh, a surrounding of water that ref would reflect the neutrons back into the central uh, radioactive material. And uh, uh, this took place about uh, maybe two months and then they uh, finished that activity and said, uh, well, we need somebody else down in the metallurgy, metallurgy organization and we know you had experience in the past in building and operating high vacuum systems, and we'd like you to go down there. And I said, well, okay. I, you know, as a young scientist, I was uh, interested in doing almost anything that would take advantage of my skills. Uh, and, 
And at that time I was, uh, let's see, I guess about uh, 22 years old. <laughs> wow. The, well, I got married in uh, June of 1942, and I was 20 years old, because I got married in June, I'd been, would be 21 in uh, October, and so by the time I got to Los Alamos, I was 22 and going into 23. So uh, that, as I say, I was a, a very young man, <laughs> but uh, as uh, my peers and my superiors determined I apparently was very capable and that's what are written records of my uh, time at Los Alamos said that I was unusually able to do the job particularly for a man my age. <laughs> Question? What was a normal day in, for you in the war? Well, typically we would start, uh, uh, my particular program, we worked just during the day. So I would start work at perhaps uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and work until 5 with a break for lunch. And I would go uh, you know, do whatever experience, experiments I had to do, uh, take time off and go back to our house, which was about half a mile away from the laboratory. Uh, Evelyn also worked in the laboratory too, so we would break for lunch together, go down, make something, and then go back to work till five. But uh, a particular day that always remains in my memory is the day that we were getting ready to uh, melt and uh, purify the metal for the third atomic bomb. Uh, we had. The first bomb, as I said, was uranium. The second bomb that was dropped was plutonium. And we had just enough metal to make one more bomb. Uh, and at that point in time when the second bomb was dropped, we didn't know whether the Japanese were going to surrender or not. Mm -hmm. and, and so the military wanted to have the third bomb ready in case the Japanese refused to surrender. And so I actually worked 24 hours on uh, units in high vacuum systems in two adjacent laboratories so that uh, I would produce one hemisphere in one and then to go on and produce the second hemisphere in the second laboratory. And uh, uh, this took actually uh, just about a full 24 hours to do because the military said that the Japanese did surrender, they wanted to have that third bomb ready to drop on Japan. Of course, we didn't need it. And there was an incident, which was an unhappy incident, involving that third, the third plutonium bomb, in that the scientists there uh, wanted to research, do research on the radiation characteristics of the plutonium. And they built a uh, system where the s sphere of plutonium, which as I say was about maybe eight inches in diameter, was inside a large uh, array of material that would reflect the neutrons that would be produced and would come outside of the sphere, would reflect these neutrons back into the sphere, and also would keep those uh, radiation, uh, the neutron radiation particularly, away from the scientists who were doing the experiment. And the uh, man who was working on that accidentally, accidentally bumped that array of shield, shielding material and as a consequence exposed himself to the radiation from this sphere of plutonium. And he, he died two weeks later from the radiation. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of a rather unhappy memory, and this was shortly after the war had ended. Mm. What was the most challenging in Cam Crosser in the project? Probably the most challenging part was to find the right materials to stabilize the uh, plutonium sphere, so that it wasn't changing 
shape during the explosion process. Were you ever worried that you might be exposed to toxic materials during the work during, on the nuclear testing? Oh, we were, we were always concerned. We tried to be safe, but in my case, I, I had to handle all this metal. The, the radiation wasn't very severe uh, just as, as I was working with it, and so I uh, was reasonably protected with rubber gloves, and so and, and we worked in what was called a dry box so that the, the dust and so on wouldn't get out. But I also had to clean up the uh, uh, high vacuum system in which I was doing the experiments. And I must have received some plutonium because uh, they would test us about every three or four weeks. And it turned out that when the war ended, I had what was called the maximum tolerable dose of plutonium in me. And I will have this long after I die because plutonium only decays to half of its quantity in over 5,000 years. So I don't know whether it'll be in my skeleton or not, but it'll be there. <laughs> so what was life like, you, like for you and your family while you were uh, the project was really very pleasant from a social point of view. Uh, you know, we made uh, a number of very good friends. Uh, it was, it's interesting that one of the men who became very famous had, had actually wrote a book which is entitled, You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, happened to be our next door neighbor. And of course the very pleasant thing that happened while we were there is that uh, my youngest, my first daughter of four, was born on April 21. 21, April 21st, 1945. And so we had a very pretty little girl to keep us company and make us happy also. <laughs> Did you keep in touch with any of the other scientists that you worked with? Uh, we were not allowed to correspond at all, and it, it turned out that uh, uh, probably maybe in uh, late 1944, when Evelyn, my wife, was pregnant, we got permission to take a trip back to Chicago to see our family. And I was told that I was not to talk to anybody in the scientific field while I was there, and I know that I was followed by uh, probably G-Men or somebody who was going to make sure that I didn't spill any of the secrets that I carried around with me. But uh, uh, the, the, you know, the fact that we were doing this very important secret work uh, made me confident that I would not uh, talk to people when I shouldn't. That's actually not right. Uh, the information on the atomic bomb was probably declassified in terms of the, the full details uh, four or five years after the war ended. But there, there were many secrets that uh, were not released until, I guess, about 10 years ago. Two years ago, my daughter says, so some of the uh, work was not declassified until just two years ago, which, of course, was interesting. How did you feel about the way Oppenheimer was treated in the 50s? And did you have any contact with him after he was treated so poorly? No. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer was, a, in terms of how he interacted with the group of Los Alamos, was extremely pleasant, uh, jolly, uh, and very caring. And of course, as I said, was made sure that we had 
a complete understanding as to the importance of what we were doing and the fact that it undoubtedly was going to kill many people as the normal bombing raids were doing, but that the fact that we did this and we had to carry out this uh, loss of life was likely to save, as the, both the Japanese and our people uh, uh, had estimated, would probably save almost a couple million lives. And he spent about two hours uh, just before the bomb was dropped uh, telling us exactly what was going on, where the bomb was going, where it probably was going to be dropped on certain critical cities in Japan, uh, and uh, that uh, we should understand, even though we were not pleased morally about the end consequences, how important it was, how many lives we were really going to save. Uh, I didn't correspond with Oppenheimer uh, after I left. Uh, the areas that I worked in, in many fields subsequently, from fuel cells and uh, many other things, silane, uh, did not uh, be of the type that he would be concerned about or particularly interested in. But I was very interested when the McCarthy hearings were taking place in the 50s, in which he was being accused of doing things badly and of being a communist. And of course, there was no indication whatsoever during the war that he had any inclinations towards communism. He was a, certainly an extremely devoted American citizen. And uh, the, the consequences of that uh, of the hearings in the 1950s where he was really destroyed more mentally uh, and morally were so uh, bad and so out of context that I know I'm sure everybody who had been with him at Los Alamos and I'm sure later on when he was at Princeton were very uh, very disturbed and certainly I was. Mm -hmm. Did you receive any awards for your work in the project? Uh, uh, not, not at uh, uh, Los Alamos, because uh, uh, the activities being so secret, they wouldn't have, or at least they didn't have programs to give awards to people. But uh, uh, afterward, I, <coughs> uh, after I got my doctorate degree, and I worked at uh, the Patel Memorial Institute on uh, high temperature materials and created and some procedures for producing ultra pure silane, which is cur a technology currently being used today to make silicon and silicon carbide and high, high purities. And uh, we have a uh, an award picture that shows that shows me down down here uh, among a number of other scientists who were the pioneers in the silicon chemistry that led to uh, the ability to make semiconductor materials from silicon <clears throat> and and of course this is. This is extremely important in that almost all electronic things today are made with uh, the high purity silicon and silicon carbide that is made by this procedure. <laughs> and then I also worked on fuel cells and have uh, awards. Uh, <coughs> this is a, an award that was given to me. Uh, uh, at, uh, I guess, at, at Patel, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was subsequent. I left Patel, I went to work for Union Carbide, and uh, this is a merit award from the Union Carbide Corporation for chemical engineering achievement in developing a new membrane support system that extends ultrafiltration. 
And, and this is a technique that is used to get high purity materials. Uh, and also uh, it, it was related to the type of membranes that I built to make fuel cells to drive what was probably one of the first fuel cell driven cars in the mid 60s. Uh, we built, I built the fuel cells, General Motors converted a Chevrolet van to uh, electrical drive and they drove, they, they put them together and they drove the van up and down in front of our corporate head, Carbide's corporate headquarters in New York and then the, the uh, uh, van was taken back by uh, uh, General Motors and uh, the fuel cell was given to the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institute. And they still, I have a letter which uh, congratulates me for that work, and, he, and they told me that, and this letter was just uh, this last year, that they still use that fuel cell to demonstrate what a fuel cell is. Hmm. And that's, just, of course, a way to get electricity from hydrogen, oxygen, or other gases. And then the last thing that my hockey coach wanted to tell you is when I told him that I was going to miss games to come here and interview you, he told me to tell you to thank you because his father was in the U.S. Army and was preparing for the land invasion of Japan when the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. So because of your work Without that, my hockey coach might never have been born. And what so, was his, what's his name? C.J. Hoff. Yeah. And it's interesting that uh, this the coach had the same background in, in that context as my brother, who was in Alaska, ready to mm. go to Japan for the invasion. <laughs> and he also could have been killed. Mm -hmm. But he's very happy now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, and these? Well, these, or these are these are a few of the patents that I'm either the author or co-author. Uh, this one is of a mixing device that very efficiently mixes gases with liquids and is used in many types of chemical operations where you might use oxygen or hydrogen particularly to react with something in the liquid phase. And this gives you a very efficient means of getting the gas bubbles mixed with the liquids. And we call it the advanced gas reactor. And then the other, this patent, which by the way, is, I have actually about 40 uh, United States patents where I'm either the author or co-author of, of the patent. Uh, this one is an interesting one in that it's, uh, it's a technique for providing oxygen to fishes, to fish that are being grown in fish farms uh, where many fish are now being grown. They need oxygen to live and uh, before I got involved with this, uh, the oxygen was provided back in their, their uh, location by taking the water and spraying it through the air to pick up oxygen from the air. Well, air contains about 20% oxygen and the balance mostly nitrogen. And so you could get about eight parts per million of oxygen uh, in the water. And, that's, and so they would have to circulate a lot of water to provide oxygen to the fish through these spray areas. Well, uh, I was working for the Lindy Division of Union Carbide at that time, and we decided that that ought to be a place to sell oxygen, which was produced by Lindy, instead of having them use air. Because if they could use oxygen, they could get 40 parts per million using pure oxygen. To get 40 parts per million or five, or five times as much uh, in the water per, per gallon as they would if they did the air spray. And so they can grow many more fish per gallon of their tanks than if they use the air. And all this is is a simple well in which the oxygen 
uh, is fed into the water going down to the bottom of the well, and, and as it goes down and then comes up around the side of the well, uh, it dissolves, the oxygen dissolves in water, and it produces the water with a high oxygen content. And so this is used very generally now in most fish farming applications. And one of your biggest awards. Okay. And then uh, one, of, uh, one of the awards that probably was most gratifying to me uh, is my award to become a corporate fellow at, within Union Carbide. Uh, at the time I got this award, I think uh, of the 100,000 or so employees of the corporation, there were only 28 corporate fellows. Mm -hmm. So I was number 29, and uh, becoming a corporate fellow is equivalent to becoming a corporate vice president in terms of salary and stature. And of course, that was very satisfying. <laughs>